One of the things that uh, you know we stress in this class, obviously, is to have uh, a project that's kind of pushing a conversation forward. How is this um, work enhancing or promoting a larger conversation? Um, and are our, our own projects kind of doing that uh, in their own right? Um, and so what we're going to do is we'll uh, start off with uh, a presentation, uh, and she's going to walk through her work, tell us a little bit about um, her role as a, a digital artist, um, a visual artist. Um, she also, uh, as I mentioned, teaches at Marist, so she teaches in the digital media area, so you get um, you know, some perspectives on that balance as well between um, teaching and, and uh, working as an artist. Uh, and then we'll open it up to uh, Q&A, so uh, we'll have an opportunity to share some questions uh, and to share some thoughts with her. Uh, and then after the Q&A, um, what I'd like us to do is we'll take a, just a short break and then we'll come back and then um, what I'd like uh, to do is just have a round table where you're able to kind of pitch your projects to Joyce, uh, tell her what you know, work you're doing, what types of concepts you're addressing in your own work, um, and then you know, that's more of an informal round table where she can get to know you uh, a little more closely as well. Um, and then you know, we'll wrap up, but overall, uh, I definitely feel this is uh, a, a presentation that's very valuable and very essential to what we're doing in our own classes, um, in our own class, and the type of, of process that we're going through. So as we're kind of witnessing and seeing her work, you know, let's make sure we're keying, on, keying in on those uh, concepts uh, that are being uh, shared in terms of um, her digital output and, and um, you know, the, the work that she's producing. The one thing I, I <coughs> would say to give Joyce an introduction is that this is uh, DEMA COM 436, so it's senior project and presentation. Um, so we have a number of students who are DEMA majors, which mm -hmm. is digital and interactive media arts. We also have a number of majors who are media production major, which is majors, which is in the comp side of things. So basically what we have is we have some traditional um, media producers in terms of film and TV. Then we also have DEMA, which is a mix of computer science, media production, and art. So mm. there's uh, a few uh, sensibilities here, but definitely everyone is kind of in that interdisciplinary mode. Um, and you know they're producing work that that is um, supposed to be the culmination of their undergraduate mm -hmm. careers, and um, hopefully we'll have a graduation ceremony and a DEEM exhibit that can celebrate uh, those instances. But um, you know I, we'll have to wait and see on that. But in the meantime, let's go ahead and give a warm welcome to Joyce Lee. Paul mentioned we met at the New Media Caucus, which is a really great organization if you don't know about it. And they actually have student scholarships every year to attend the conference and to do some research throughout the year. So if you don't know about it, I would encourage you to look into it. It's a free member organization. All the artists and designers that are a part of it are really down to earth and kind and um, doing really amazing research. So my name is Joyce Eugene Lee. I am a, a visual artist based in uh, New York City, and I teach at Marist College, as Paul mentioned. And I did want to tell you a little bit about my background before I launch into my work, because I do have a background in communications, and I think it might be interesting for some of you all to know about it. Um, so I uh, grew up to um, immigrant parents who were born in China, but grew up in Taiwan and fled during the Communist Revolution in the late 40s. Um, so I am Chinese Taiwanese American. I was born in the U.S., but I grew up very bicultural, or there's a term that um, is very popular now in the art world, transnational. So I grew up with multiple um, kind of nationality and cultural backgrounds. Grew up um, speaking Chinese at home, but English in school. Went to um, Chinese school on Sundays, and grew up eating Chinese food and like sloppy joes and pizzas on Fridays. <laughs> so it was a very mixed um, cultural heritage to grow up in. And um, this is actually my father here, the little baby with the beanie. And um, my great grandmother is holding him. This is my grandmother in the back, like to my great grandmother's um, left, and to my to her right is my grandfather. Um, so when I went to uh, um, 
undergrad, actually, I was studying uh, communications at University of Pennsylvania. And I was uh, double major psychology and communications. But my junior year, I interned in New York City. And two weeks after returning to campus, this happened. And it radically transformed my life path. So I was studying to do fashion marketing at the time and had just in interned at Ralph Lauren Children's Wear in um, the fashion district in Manhattan. And at the same time had done an internship um, with a Japanese American artist named Makoto Fujimura. And back then internships were, no internships were paid and it was totally legal. Um, but I had a really interesting experience where I thought I had been studying my entire four year, three years, three and a half years, um, to become a uh, fashion marketer and was very surprised I did not enjoy my internship experience, even though the company was, you know, Ralph Lauren's a well-known company and there was nothing wrong with the work itself, but I just realized very quickly it wasn't the right culture fit for me. And um, growing up to Chinese American parents, art was never on the table for discussion, you know. My parents were actually very progressive and didn't expect me to be a doctor, lawyer, engineer, but um, I was, I still felt pressure on myself to have a, you know, a, a type of career path that would be very stable and earn good money, especially um, with a high price tag of an Ivy League education. Um, so I never considered anything creative as something that I would pursue. But after I spent that summer with artist who actually, his studio was in Tribeca and his kids went to school downtown in the financial district, um, they, their lives were highly impacted by 9-11. And one of my classmates' fathers actually died in 9-11 as well. Um, you know, the guy I was dating at the time and a bunch of my friends worked on Wall Street. And so I realized after 9-11 happened that I wanted to wake up every morning really believing in the work that I was about to do that day and working in fashion marketing was not it for me. Um, but shadowing this artist all summer, I had really gotten my eyes open to what an artist's life really looks like. And as a child, always grew up drawing and painting and uh, was voted most likely to become an artist in my high school. And so I decided that I wanted to, to really um, give being an artist a try. I had no idea how I was going to do it because I wasn't studying it in school, but I figured it out. So I ended up um, moving to Manhattan after graduation and working on Wall Street, or no, on, in Madison Avenue doing fashion as I had um, studied. I worked in um, advertising where I worked on fashion clients and consumer products. But um, at night, I would take art classes at the Art Students League, at Hunter College, at the School of Visual Arts, and I eventually put together a portfolio six years later and went back to graduate school. So this is um, one of the pieces that I made in graduate school that really um, paid homage to 9-11 and kind of that transformative power in my life. And so um, this is uh, a two-channel projection into a corner where I worked with green screen and some of my um, fellow students who I had embody um, kind of these maybe business people that um, were uh, kind of fascinated and curious about the sky and they're in the video, I, I won't show it to you because there's too many videos to show, but they're taking pictures of this glowing, hovering diamond shape above them. And it's actually compositionally um, modeled after Francisco Goya's Yard with Lunatics, this insane asylum where there are, um, all the patients are freaking out about the sky. So it has some parallel with 9-11. So when I went to grad school, I thought I was, I went in with painting and I thought that that's what I would be doing, but I came out a video artist. And um, I realized very quickly that the method of storytelling with the moving image was really um, something that um, I learned quickly and felt like was very natural and I loved kind of the collaborative process working with models and actors and choreographing these scenes. So I'll just show you a couple of works. Um, this is a piece where, uh, a white dot starts on the ground and it slowly starts to expand and as it expands you see a girl, who's me, <laughs> in that circle and she then breaks the plane um, of the 2D surface of the ground and crawls out of the hole and then after I crawl out of the hole um, the circle shrinks back down to a dot and it loops all over again. 
This is um, a similar installation where I have three channel projections, so two different pieces that are in opposition to one another. And I'm still playing with a corner in a similar way where um, a line of light emerges in the corner and it expands into a square that then becomes kind of this portal where these two characters are interacting with it and they eventually become consumed by this white light. And um, on the side is um, a character that's sitting down kind of in a, in a meditation position that has a point of um, color emerge from her chest and expand out, transforming colors and also consuming her. And in this work, I'm interested in comparing the difference between pictorial space in Eastern philosophy and painting with Western um, uh, philosophy and painting and kind of discussing how the point of view uh, of major world religions, be they monotheistic in the West or um, you know, pluralistic or <clears throat> not even one central God, right, in um, Eastern philosophies and religions, how they kind of reflect um, on the world out view of that culture and is also then seen in the visual arts. So here's another um, uh, pairing of works from that show where you where I was really exploring pictorial space specifically and so I'll just explain a little bit about how I create these works these are all um, pastel paintings that I make on paper and those establish the environments and then I film the people on green screen and embed them into the drawings so they are a form of animation if you have any questions feel free to stop me during okay um, this is another piece where I start to bring that 2D space more into three dimensions. So here you have a, another ground projection, but it's onto um, 400 pounds of sand that I molded on the ground. And I collaborated with a Chinese um, painter and calligrapher who was at the time 83 years old. And he painted some um, Chinese uh, goldfish or koi, right, Japanese koi. And I 3D animated some water and we built this koi pond or goldfish pond. Um, so the piece is called Jingyu Mirage. Jingyu means goldfish in Chinese. And here's another installation that I did that continued my um, playing with sand. Um, it was two pieces uh, where one is um, a giant pile of sand that has a hole in the middle. And I created this kind of swirling vortex with um, text that I was clipping from magazines and newspapers. So this piece was called Water Wisdom Miracle Workers. And the wor words kind of swirl around and go down the hole. And here we have um, three giant weather balloons, about six, they range from like three to six feet in diameter. And there were words that I was extracting from newspaper headlines, scanning in and then digitally collaging and they kind of hover like a virtual cloud. And I'll show you video examples um, with this next piece. Um, so continuing the idea of um, something kind of falling in and out of balance, I created uh, an exhibition called State of the Disunion in 2018 during the time of um, presidential, uh, pre the presidential um, race. And at the time, what was happening was Hillary had just won the Democratic nomination and Trump was the candidate and they were in political debate. And um, I'll let this play in the background. It might be, hopefully it's not too loud. Um, what was happening is there was all this discourse about the travel ban, travel ban with Middle East and North African countries. Um, and uh, President Trump was using a lot of what I would deem hate speech in some of these discussions. And so I was wondering, let me just turn this down a little bit. Uh, well, it's okay, I'll let it play. Um, so I was wondering as an immigrant how these other people, uh, the people who were Muslim um, in our country or in the West were feeling with this very tense political and social conversation that was happening. And so what I did was I clipped um, the front pages of newspapers from around the world from the Newseum, um, which is a museum about news in DC that archives about 900 um, newspaper front pages every single day. And on the day of um, Hillary winning the Democratic nomination and on the day that Trump won the election, I clipped all these um, newspaper headlines and pictures and then I collaged them into this animation that you see here. 
It's a three-channel animation that wraps around a cylindrical screen suspended from the ceiling with an AstroTurf rug underneath where you can sit on the rug and or lay down and look into the cylinder or you could walk around it and it's an immersive installation. So here you see some footage from the Women's March that happened um, during that time and this is aerial footage of DC during the Women's March and you can see here with this animation that's rising up some of the newspaper headlines from those two dates that I mentioned. The music that you hear is a piece by a Finnish composer named Jean Sibelius who wrote a piece, it's called a um, tone poem, which I think is really cool, the idea of making a poem through sound only. Um, the piece is called Swan of Tanella, and it's about this mythical landscape where a protagonist enters the land of the dead to try to cap capture this mythical swan, and in doing so doesn't even realize that he dies in the process. And so I just felt that the political landscape and the journalistic landscape at the time was really ominous and there was um, this kind of um, dystopian wool being thrown over many voters' lives at the time. And so I felt uh, I wanted to create this media landscape that was immersive. Um, here's a piece that is, uh, also has a similar um, Oh, actually, I should say the State of the Disunion opened during Trump's first uh, State of the Union address. And this is a piece, actually, that was created even before that um, and also wrestles with a similar um, topic. So in expanding upon this idea of um, hate speech against Muslims, I decided to do a performance piece. So for 28 days, um, I decided to do a performative drawing. So you see here um, 60 feet of uh, drawing paper that's unrolled. And three times a day, I knelt in, um, I call it empathetic meditation with what was happening. And every time I knelt down, I would trace the outline of my body. And so I created these, this kind of collage of um, gestural body um, contours onto this paper. And I was invited to do an exhibition in Grand Rapids, Michigan um, at the same time as Art Walk, or no, what's it called, Art Prize. Um, so it's this big prize for um, American artists can enter this competition and there's like a popular vote and they vote for winners and the winner gets like a quarter of a million dollars, I think. And so this gallery was showing a, a collection of vintage prayer rugs. This is just like next door to the gallery that I was showing in and I thought, Let's make something about this interesting history. And so I, I did this performance and traced my body and then took those shapes and animated them into an animation with two projectors across a 60 foot length gallery. And I collaborated with this guy who runs the Fat Cat Fab Lab in the West Village um, in Manhattan. And he is a musician, actually, but also this kind of hacker. And we used an Arduino to create a motion-sensitive LED installation, um, which you'll see here. Because the gallery had this unique 22-foot skylight um, that is a cube that is over the center of the gallery. And so here you see my body um, drawings that have been animated in the patterns of the vintage prayer rugs that you saw. There are, I took five different historical patterns from the prayer rugs and I animated my body shapes to recreate a digital prayer rug across the gallery floor. And when you walk under the skylight, it senses your presence and turns on and changes colors, which I kind of thought of as a, um, uh, almost like a metaphysical call and response with the source of light. Um, so, you know, Muslims, I'm not Muslim myself, but Muslims pray five times a day towards Mecca, and there is a structure called a kibba that's there, which is a big black stone cube that is symbolic of, of um, you know, a deity. And so this kind of skylight mimics, or is a visual metaphor for that call and response um, process. Uh, the interesting thing I learned in doing this was that the uh, prayer rugs actually have a lot of um, visual symbols that are um, meaningful to the act of prayer itself. So I learned a lot in kind of piecing together my drawings. And here, this particular pattern um, on these prayer rugs, there's this kind of like house-like structure that happens towards the upper portion of the prayer rug. And it actually represents um, 
kind of the idea of um, the temple or a congregation of people within a house that are worshiping. And so there's this motion with the animation that kind of Im tries to embody that um, idea or that movement. Um, any questions so far? And this, this piece was silent, actually. There was no sound. Okay. So um, I mentioned before that I enjoy collaborating. So here's a project that I did with a very young audience. Um, I was invited by the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York to do a workshop during their World Culture, Heritage, uh, World, World Culture Festival in 2018. Um, so they titled the piece, or the installation, Project Your Future. And so here is just a snapshot of the installation. Um, I created an animation that was very celestial and uh, there was sound to it and then filled the room with these roving um, LED uh, lights that would move across the space and a bunch of weather balloons. And what we did was we put a bunch of supplies out on the table where um, young participants you know, school age and even younger could come in and use translucent materials to create light sculptures. And the idea is they're supposed to illustrate and capture what they think the future might look like. And then we created mini projections with their sculptures. So here's an example of one of the pieces that um, this boy built. And, <laughs> and you can see us projecting that onto the wall. And here is another one that I thought was really good. Um, and this was a great process for me because it's a very open-ended project. And so it's really up to the participants to make the content with me. Um, and that way of working is really interesting to me. I like, as an artist, to kind of set up a structure that um, participants can respond to. And that discussion or that discourse that happens as a result is really what makes the art. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I showed you a lot of projection pieces that I make with animation. But now I'm going to move into some work that is a little bit more performance based and working with technology in a different way. So in 2011, I was asked to be a um, residency coordinator for a group of North American artists, about a dozen or so, on a trip to China. And I worked with a curator named James Elaine, who at the time was and still sometimes does some curating for the UCLA Hammer Museum in Los Angeles. And he has a real passion for curating emerging artists in China. And um, that was in 2011 when there was a lot of fake Apple stores that were popping up around China with the release of, I think it's the iPhone 4. And so I became curious about how is it that um, Apple, which is this iconic American design and technology um, company that creates like consumer products that run our lives, literally. Um, how is it that so many of their um, uh, products are made in a country where these products are not readily available for purchase? So what was happening was these fake Apple stores were cropping up so that Chinese people could buy these fake iPhones. And you literally would not be able to tell that it was a fake Apple store. And there was a lot of pressure to uh, produce these stores, uh, produce these phones as quickly as possible. So the company, Foxconn, that produces these phones, which is actually a Taiwanese company, um, was having some problems with um, factory workers committing suicide. I don't know if you remember this happening. So. Um, uh, in 2012, there was an art fair happening in Washington, D.C., and I believe that was during Obama's presidential election. And so I created a performance piece called Made in China, where I dressed up as a factory worker for a mysterious company. Um, and I took out, um, I rolled in a peddler's cart where I was hawking art goods off of the cart. And there was a projection behind me on the wall with an assembly line of factory workers who were actually all Chinese artists that I invited to um, be actors. And they're assembling the products that you see me selling off the cart. Um, and so, uh, it was an exciting time because of the election. I, I didn't realize so many of my pieces center around presidential elections. But um, as I was selling these goods off the cart, I was having conversations with people about um, global trade. 
and the role that the U.S. plays in being um, an economic leader and a world superpower and our trade with China, who is an emerging world power, or is arguably also an, a world power. So the cost of what we produce in America, especially if you think about things like the iPhone, are considered the pinnacle of um, creative production, um, modern design, um, and really set the um, market for what is considered coveted uh, consumer products, right? But the cost of producing these is kept low because they're actually not made by Americans. They're made by foreigners, and yet we sell them at a very, very high price. And so what is that relationship with this act of manufacturing and trade that happens? And so this piece is called Made in China. And I'm selling these, I should have brought some because I have a whole bunch, but there are these little buttons that are in a, in a case where the logo is kind of modeled after the Apple logo and also the American and Chinese flags. Consumers do not know what they're getting and they can pay whatever they want, but when they pay me, it has to go directly into this slot of the cart. And as a factory worker, I have no contact whatsoever with the revenue stream. And um, the funny thing is, I actually gave myself the challenge to not use any made in China products or materials in producing this project, like no wood from China, no paper from China, no print companies that actually, you know, when you submit files online for a print company and you get something shipped to you within a week, most of those things are actually sent overseas, digitally um, printed and produced in China and then expedited back to the US and that's how you get your cheap products online. Um, so I, I chose only American, um, companies and as a result, had my, my project cost probably four times what it would have cost if I was just going um, by what's cheap versus going by what's American made. So that was actually the conversation we were having. Um, and another layer to the, the project is that at an art fair, everybody is selling goods, which is art. And what is the economy of kind of the market of, of art in the US? And so I was also layering in that conversation piece as I was hawking goods off um, the peddler's cart. All right, so that project made me more curious about um, China at large and contemporary life in China. And so when I brought over the um, group of artists for the, Amer uh, for the residency in China, we uh, you know, experienced a lot of interesting things that we don't experience here in the States. So as a residency coordinator, I had to give every artist who was joining our trip a VPN. Does anybody know what a VPN is? or have used one, I see kind of maybe, do you know what VPN stands for? It stands for Virtual Proxy Network, okay? And sometimes college campuses use them. So for, like for example at Marist, if I wanted to access um, an internal website off campus, um, there's a firewall that protects um, the camp campus intranet from being accessed by outside external IPs. So I actually have to use a VPN which is basically a virtual proxy network, and it, it makes my computer, even if I'm off-site, seem as if I have an IP address that's on campus so that I can log into that intranet, okay? In most cases, VPNs are used for situations where you're in an area where um, the internet is in some way censored or not truly open so that you can then access the internet in a place where it is open. So when you go to China, I had to give every single artist um, and designer that was on our residency a VPN, which is a piece of software that you install on your computer, you dial in, and essentially you're surfing the internet as if you're in America even when you're in China. Okay. So. Um, I became interested in kind of the patterns I experienced in Central on the internet as that was censored when I was in China. And it was really interesting to see how certain key phrases that you surf, um, search on the internet in China would result in your um, Wi-Fi getting broken or maybe slowing down significantly. And so if you're not aware, the Chinese government um, is an authoritarian one. It's um, communist officially, but is um, a social, uh, model that is unique to China and isn't traditionally um, communist by like Marx standards, okay? Um, and they have multiple layers of censorship. Um, so the first being that 
any company or person in China that has an, uh, a website or any kind of um, web presence has to self-censor. And there are, I think, 45 internet regulations that the government has put out that everybody has to obey. Um, so that includes companies with websites, American companies in China that want to have websites, they all have to self-censor, okay? And then there is another layer, which is the firewall, which is a government-imposed um, uh, kind of layer of censorship that is uh, ge largely generated by artificial intelligence, AI. Okay, so there's all these algorithmic codes that look for things that are not deemed safe or good for the population, and this AI removes all these things from the internet. And then there's also a layer where manual, it's manually done, where um, government workers are actually out scouring the internet and they're looking for things that are considered sensitive and they're taking it off the internet, okay? So in response to all this, I decided to create a project called Firewall. And um, part of it came out of a curiosity, let me see what I have here next. Uh, part of it came out of a curiosity of um, how internet censorship works, but I was largely interested in how, if you have censored or limited access to information, how that actually changes your view of the world where you live and then the world beyond that, and how that also then shapes how you view your own self-identity and the identity of others. Um, so um, the first year that we did the residency was a great success. It was super fun, and we were planning on doing it every single year after that. Um, but unfortunately, our local assistant, who is just maybe a couple years older than you all um, and was a queer um, performance artist and photographer, he ended up uh, committing suicide um, the following summer. And so as a result, our residency got canceled, and it didn't happen again. And so uh, in combination with how we were experiencing internet censorship in China and the loss of our friend, um, I started to think about how much of you know, what led to his taking his own life was a result of maybe this very um, manipulated um, perception that he had of himself through the internet. Because, I mean, things are a lot different now because I think LGBT issues are always evolving, um, but I think he had really a large admiration for um, American life and wanted to experience life outside of China and felt a lot of pressure and constraint on his own life as a citizen there. So Firewall most recently popped up at Marist just, uh, I think, two weeks ago. So this was our installation where we had three search stations and um, students could come and participate. And um, in conjunction with that, we brought over a BuzzFeed reporter named Mega Rajagopalan, and she is um, in her early 30s, a journalist that was working for BuzzFeed in China. She was their first correspondent to set up an office there, and she recently um, had her visa denied and revoked and is had to leave China under very high-pressured circumstances because she was the first reporter to break the news about um, the re-education camps in Xinjiang province for Uyghurs, uh, which is an ethnic minority that is largely Muslim and lives in the um, northwest provin province of China. Have any of you all heard um, about these re-education camps on the news lately? If you haven't, I encourage you to look into it. There are an estimated one million um, Uyghurs that are imprisoned in these re-education camps now. Nobody really understands why this is happening or what's happening to them inside these prisons. Um, but uh, it's being um, kind of paralleled with the Holocaust and um, Jewish uh, concentration camps from World War II. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So our first pop-up happened in New York, and um, I'll show you a little video that will explain how Firewall works. I don't know if this will. Yeah. My name is Joyce Yujing Lee, and this is Firewall Internet Cafe at Chinatown Soup in the Lower East Side of New York City. So this project is really interested in examining how information access works online. The project is investigating issues of translation, issues of internet freedom, and creates a space for the public to activate an art installation and become part of the project itself. People would come into the cafe and be able to enjoy free tea and free Wi-Fi and be able to simultaneously surf the internet in the U.S. through Google search engine and compare those results with what they would see behind the Great Firewall of China on Baidu, which is the most popular search engine in China. 
I was very fortunate to work with Dan Pfeiffer, who is an artist and a technologist, and he specializes in creating internet-based work. The searches are all being compared in English and Chinese on Google and Baidu, respectively, through images only. We have a Chrome browser plugin called Firewall. It takes everything that's put into a Google or Baidu search and then translates it to the opposing language. So for example, if it's English, it's going to be translated into Chinese on Baidu. And then it pulls up the image searches that correlates with queries in both search engines. So even if you can't speak both languages or read and write in Chinese, you're able to use this plugin and get a really quick look at how internet censorship produces different image results in both countries. Dan and I specifically constructed Firewall to work this way because we wanted to make sure that the program and the experience would be accessible regardless of if you're a native English speaker or a native Chinese speaker because pictures are universal. Firewall is a project that I initially thought of when I was in Beijing with a group of artists from North America. And I was working with James Elaine, a curator who's based in Beijing. We were working a lot with using VPNs so that the American artists were able to surf the internet freely while they were in Beijing. It was interesting to note the patterns that would happen as these artists were surfing the internet and seeing how censorship works online in China. I became curious about how people's understanding of different places are formed by what they see on the internet. Like The things that people who have no previous knowledge think of searching are often surprising and unusual because they don't have necessarily a historical or political context for their searches. So they'll think creatively about regular life and what are things that look different in life between China and the US. For me, who grew up as a middle-class American. China is about as far removed from my kind of cultural base of understanding as anything I could think of. And I'm excited to be able to Google something and take a glimpse into what someone on the other side of the tunnel might be by doing at the same time. For me, it feels like touching back into that childhood curiosity of something that is so other, um, but at the same time, exactly the same. We had 60 children come from PS 184, which is a public school here in Chinatown. A lot of children of immigrant families participate. Also two college groups, Marymount Manhattan and the other from Jersey City University. It's been really interesting to see how, based on your age and your demographic, you think of searching different things. So a lot of the um, middle schoolers search pop culture and video games and things like that. And it was interesting to think about what children online or young people online might be thinking about or what might be trending in China as well. Through our various events too and inviting different Chinese nationals to participate, we've really been able to capture American art audience and then also Chinese in New York City. I'm from Taiwan, so basically no kind of situation a little bit. But I just want to come here to see how he actually like show the differences. The term I type here in Chinese, I'm pretty sure it means what I'm looking for. Yeah, it's the correct words, but somehow they just show different things, which I am not sure why. Maybe just the way the search engine works differently, maybe, yeah, but I just try to figure out some of the things that are really different. I lived in China for 10 years. My life was impacted by censorship. I had to use a VPN just to get to Google, and uh, Gmail, Facebook, like normal things that in America we, we take for granted to use freely. This is important because it shines a light on to the way other people in other countries have to deal with censorship. And it made me realize where each country places their importance, especially when you put in political terms that are not sensitive in our country versus sensitive in China. For example, if you do a search on Tiananmen Square in Google, you see pictures of what actually happened in Tiananmen Square. And when you do that in Baidu, there are only perfect pictures of the actual building in Tiananmen Square. And 
that's censored. But on the reverse side, is it censorship or is it just different perspective that when you search, let's say, the term Black Lives Matter, in Google you get, you know, a lot of posters or something relevant to the movement versus you search that term in Baidu and pictures of blackberries come up. One topic in one country has a lot of meaning versus in another country has zero meaning. How do we bring about conversations to create understanding and awareness around that topic? It's been interesting to see people's reactions to the differences in images and also the subtle ways that images can communicate in ways that words can't. And how the photographs that are presented by one search engine really can represent a national perspective. Okay, so um, this project was really investigating a couple of things. So censorship, namely, between both the U.S. and China. And it's really easy to say that censorship exists in China because of the, um, the way that the government is structured there. But actually, censorship exists in the U.S. as well. Instead of state censorship, we have um, corporate censorship. So much of what you see on the internet is largely controlled by large companies like Google and all the advertisers that are willing to kind of pay for the algorithm for their searches to come up on top. Um, the other thing that I am interested in with this project is how virtual borders are created because of censorship. So not only in how we understand and um, relate to people that are different from us or different people groups and communities, but also um, you know, what are the divisions that happen within global politics and um, regulations that happen as um, a result of these kinds of phenomena. Um, and then uh, I'm also interested in how art, and specifically interactive or digital art, can be a way of conducting social research. You know, obviously this is not a normal ethnographic or social study. It's, um, it's an interactive art project, web art, right? So it's not perfect and there are a lot of things that kind of go wrong in our pop-ups, um, but what are the kind of social and ethical implications of art projects like this? Um, so one crazy thing that happened as a result of our first pop-up in New York that I could have never anticipated was that we hosted um, a, a series of panel discussions because the project is largely grant funded. And so we hosted a panel called Networked Feminism um, that happened actually in a hacking space uh, on the Lower East Side. And we had a really great turnout to see a bunch of um, women specifically from China who are feminists and using the internet as a tool for activism. activism. So for example, um, uh, a lesbian um, filmmaking couple that actually was the first um, couple to produce a film about the UN um, Women's Summit that happened in Beijing, I think in 1995. Um, and also uh, Lu Ping, who you see speaking up there, she um, runs a feminist blog in China that got shut down by the government and they ransacked her home and tried to arrest her. Um, and there was also uh, a human rights lawyer who was going to speak about her work with a single child policy. And um, how many of you are aware of the single child policy in China? Kind of? Okay, good. So it's been updated um, quite a bit since the 70s, but um, this lawyer works with women who have had forced abortions, like in the back of vans, for example, when they accidentally or intentionally get pregnant with um, their second child. And she was able to find a loophole in the law where maybe medical professionals who conducted these forced abortions accidentally didn't fill out forms correctly and was able to win two cases against the government over these trials. And so she's the first um, lawyer to do that. She is young, single working mother, um, and she is a partner at a law firm in Guangzhou, which is a southern province of China. She was gonna talk about her work on this panel. Um, what ended up happening was that um, the night before her talk, a bunch of local government authorities in Guangzhou reached out to her law firm and they said, hey, you need to control your lawyer. Your lawyer should not be working with this artist in New York over this um, our project. And she called me um, from, she actually was based at Yale, so in Connecticut, um, doing a, f a postdoc fellowship about um, researching the U.S. Constitution and um, kind of uh, laws that protect different reproductive rights for women. 
And uh, she contacted me, she was like, hey, I got this crazy phone call, um, you know, I think this is becoming a, a very sensitive situation, what should we do? And I was surprised because I'm not famous, you know, I'm just an emerging artist working on this topic. And so we decided we would make it look like she canceled by taking her name off of um, the websites that had advertised uh, this event. So even though Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that is banned in China, people still use it. And they had spread word about this event. And somehow, government authorities in China saw it. And so we took down these postings, and she was going to be prepared to come and participate anyways the next day. So the morning of the event, she calls me again, and she said that things have really escalated and gotten very serious. So the local authorities reached out to her law firm again, and they said, you need to control your lawyer. Your lawyer has to quit her fellowship at Yale, come back to China now, and is never allowed to speak in, in public ever again about her work or her research. And so we knew at that point it was a very serious threat. And so she did not come and participate. And the audience that we anticipated attending the event, we required RSVPs um, to come because we knew that potentially there could be some security issues. And of course, the night of the event, there were four people who came, all Chinese. They did not look like artists or activists. They were a totally different age group, didn't speak great English. They showed up without RSVPing. They sat in the front row. And we're pretty sure they were civilian spies that were sent by the government to make sure that this lawyer did not show up for the event. Um, luckily, Yale is very savvy and they sent somebody last minute as we were walking into the venue, a total stranger showed up who actually is very aware of um, all the activist community issues and she presented on her work in, in her place. So as a result of that government intervention, Firewall got a lot of press. It was a really stressful thing to go through, but be people became really aware of how sensitive um, the issue of censorship is to the Chinese government and how they really try to suppress and control um, the arts that are kind of addressing these issues. So we got invited after that uh, initial event to pop up in various places since then. So this is a pop-up that we did in Norway. This is a pop-up so here's a picture actually of us in Norway searching with some um, Chinese activist daughters. Their fathers are um, human rights activists and lawyers who have been jailed by the Chinese government and their daughters who are your age, they're in college in the U.S., speak on behalf of what has happened to their family so that more people are aware of what's going on. Um, and then here actually is our pop-up in Lincoln Center in New York um, at the Alice Tully Hall and the, the person you see in the yellow jacket is actually that lawyer that got in trouble as a result of our pop-up. We didn't talk for about an entire year until she was able to figure out how to get academic asylum, pull out her son who was still in China at the time safely, and now they're here in the U.S. forever. They're not going to be able to go back. Um, last year we popped up in Hong Kong, which was super exciting. This is before the protests erupted in um, that following spring, uh, but we were able to work with local artists from China who were interested in the topic of internet censorship who came to Hong Kong anonymously and collaborated with me on um, an installation about um, censorship. They produced a interactive play um, where you would vote for what would happen in the next scene through Facebook. And so it was live and interactive through digital technologies, which was really exciting. And we had lots of good conversations about what was happening in Hong Kong with the umbrella movement and the protests and how that relates to censorship. Um, just this year, actually, last month, I did a pop-up in Vienna at the Women's Association for Art, where we got to discuss more feminist issues and kind of how um, equality is or is not represented on the internet now. And then most recently, we did a pop-up in Asheville, North Carolina, with an art collective called Tiger Strikes Asteroid. And this was the first time I presented a bunch of images on the wall of historical searches that we've done throughout the um, four years that the project has now been running. And I just wanted to show you an example of some of the um, things that you might find on Google that you would not be able to find on the internet in China on Baidu. So going back to the Uyghur crisis in the Xinjiang province of China, here you see um, how Chinese authorities appear to have dramatically expanded a re-education camp for the persecuted Uyghur Muslim minority near Kashgar, Xinjiang. So this is a photograph of, um, from a satellite or from an, you know, an aerial shot in 2017, 
and then how much that re-education camp and facility has grown um, in 2018. Um, so a lot of this stuff that's happening that we don't, that locals in China certainly aren't hearing about um, are um, available to the rest of the world through um, different kinds of surveillance and so, so uh, technologies and social media. Um, so you can learn more about my projects on my um, Instagram or on the websites. And before I open the floor up to questions, I did want to show you a little bit about the firewall website because um, we've developed a new functionality that um, helps participants interact with our project even if you don't get to experience a pop-up in person. So um, every single search that participants have done are archived in our search library. And this is a new thing that we just built. So you can see a lot of people are searching for coronavirus. Um, so we have a database of over 4,000 terms and you can click on the terms and see what the search result was when that search was done. And then you can also click into the search and see more detail. Um, so here is the top row is Google, the bottom row is Baidu. And actually you can see that um, censorship doesn't seem to be that apparent right now about coronavirus in China. But the interesting thing is we've been doing this project since 2016. So when we did our, v, um, our Vienna pop-up, actually there was no pictures of coronavirus in China. Now you can see pictures of coronavirus in China because everybody knows it's happening. But when it was first being, um, uh, when news was first leaking out in December and January, there were no pictures available. Okay, and then um, here you can look at the images and you know you can decide whether or not you think the search is um, censored or not. Do y'all think that's censored? Top row, Google, bottom row, Baidu? No? Okay, so you can then say and vote on other people's searches. You can click on uncensored and I'll say in this case I think it's a good translation, right? And you can scroll down and actually see every single time coronavirus has been searched since our pop-ups began and how those searches might have changed over time. So this is an interesting one. So this would be from um, February. And for some reason, nothing came up on Baidu. Um, let's see how far back can we go. Yeah, so this was in Vienna in January. And you can see the pictures were quite different back then, right? So you see some virus pictures at the end, but the first images that you would see don't have anything. And one of the interesting findings that we've been able to learn through this project is that oftentimes when something is censored in China, um, Chinese people come up with ways to get around those firewalls. So instead of showing photographic pictures where AI can look for certain things, they draw cartoons. Because in cartoons, you can use stylistic, um, you know, um, ways to manipulate the image. And instead of using typewritten um, computer text, generated text, if you handwrite it, your AI sensors can't pick up on that as easily. Um, and then you can also filter by um, location. So for example, we could just look at the searches that were done in Poughkeepsie. Um, and we could also censor, you know, filter by whether people voted on the results being censored or not. So even if you, don't get to experience a pop-up in the future, you can still interact with our data that we've collected. And that's all I have for today. Have you ever <coughs> received any like, like emails or like threats personally from the Firewall Project? So I think because I'm an American citizen, I have a lot more uh, protection than um, the women who are on that panel. So in that case, they were all Chinese citizens, and I think that was a lack of kind of foresight on my part. And you know, the situation that happened with that Chinese lawyer was really unfortunate. I have not had any problems with Chinese authorities, but surprisingly, and this goes back to the conversation of censorship going both ways, so um, I have gotten tons of um, uh, bot um, generated emails from law firms in the US that want to sue Firewall over copyright infringement. Because I'm essentially caching the internet, right? And so 
all these things that you can see as snapshots of the internet are saved in our database and you can go and click on those thumbnails. And so what happens is there's these copyright bots that um, law firms employ to scour the internet and look for any cases of copyright infringement. So we redesigned our website so that these thumbnails are not so easily accessible, but I was getting served um, lawsuit papers repeatedly from these law firms um, over um, my copyright infringement. Um, of course, we're not actually um, violating copyright because we're not making any profit off of the project. And, um, you know, the project largely has educational um, intent. Uh, and we're not showing high-res images, we're just showing little thumbnails. Um, but I thought that was an interesting example of how state censorship and um, corporate censorship operate differently. And our country is highly uh, litigious, largely because corporations in our um, country have more rights oftentimes than individuals. And so I have experienced harassment on that end. <laughs> That's a good question. Yes. What are your plans for the rest of the year? Do you have any more art installations that you're working on or any more work with Firewall that you're planning on doing for the year? Yeah, that's a good question. So Firewall was supposed to show at the Oslo Freedom Forum, which is a conference run by the Human Rights Foundation. Um, and they're the ones who have brought me to Norway a couple of times. So we were supposed to do another version of it in May. Um, but the coronavirus has postponed that. <laughs> So, you know, I don't know what's going to happen with that pop-up. Um, I am still working with um, some web developers um, because right now what we're doing is we're taking the back end of the over 5,000 pieces of data that we've collected um, and we're trying to restructure the code and build something a little bit more robust because what we would like to do eventually is um, take um, research that has been done by organizations like University of Toronto Citizen Lab, and also um, Harvard has Harvard has a Beekman Center for Internet Research, um, and then there's another organization in California called China Digital Times that's run by I think UC Berkeley, and they all have these giant databases of terms that they know are censored on the internet in China. And so what we're trying to develop is some artificial intelligence ourselves. We're going to take those databases of sensitive terms and force them through firewall to do searches on what the results are now for those sensitive terms. And what that will do is increase our database tremendously. Because right now we have a lot of images, but that's just from people sitting down and doing searches. If we can actually have um, AI generated searches, we could you know, quadruple our database. And then I'm working with some um, web developers and infographic um, information visualization designers in Portland. And we're gonna try to figure out once that AI is designed and we have more data, a larger data set, how we can take that information and really create some interesting um, visualization of the data so that people can kind of understand what are the big learnings that we're seeing out of this project. Like what are trends, maybe censorship trends that we've seen? Um, what are the most commonly censored things? How has that evolved over time? Um, so that's what we're working on now. I have a little bit of grant funding to finish that up. Um, but because it's kind of a passion project that I do, I don't get paid to do this. <laughs> Everything's kind of slow moving, you know, so it's hard to see how that will turn out. Um, as far as other art projects, uh, I have an ex a solo exhibition coming up, actually in Poughkeepsie, so it's not too far, if y'all are willing to travel, um, at a gallery downtown called Women's Work. Um, it's on Clinton Street, and it's a small um, DIY gallery run by a local artist. That um, show will have a little bit more to do with kind of trans the transnational aspect of my research, um, and it's probably going to be photo-based sculpture and some video. Uh, and then I have another solo show coming up at the Delaware Contemporary Museum in Wilmington. That will be in the fall. Both of those shows are in the fall. Yeah, nothing planned for Connecticut. <laughs> um, yeah. Other questions? Um, so, for your um, the first two projects that you showed us, uh, was there um, was there a purpose like in the colors that you chose for it? Because I noticed like there was like a running theme in in your color. Like, in, I don't know what color it is, but it was like a nice purplish, yeah. bluish light. 
Yeah. Um, that was, there, yeah, go, sorry, go ahead. Was there like a meaning behind that sort of company you had? Yeah, you know, um, I know what you're talking about. It was not intentional. I think um, that's maybe just a style that comes from the days when I uh, used to paint. You know, like I mentioned, I went to grad school as a painter and I came out as a video artist. So I think I have some aesthetic um, and stylistic choices that are kind of carried over from when I used to paint. Um, I do think about um, colors in relationship to the kind of emotional tone that I want to create for the viewer. So for the State of the Disunion piece where I was trying to lull people into this media landscape, I did want to present kind of poppy colors that look beautiful, but then when you linger and really look at the content of the video and the content um, of the headlines and the text that you realize there's like a darker undertone. Um, so I think about kind of, um, you know, what kind of emotional impact I want to have when I use the colors, but nothing further than that in terms of planning out a color palette. Yeah. Did you, I'm curious if you saw something specifically in the oh, colors. The, um, yeah, like, um, yeah, the state of uh, this union and the other one that you saw, I just noticed that like, it had like the same color scheme yeah. in a way. So I was wondering if that was kind of like, uh, if there was like some type of meaning or that was like your unique taste um, taking it. Yeah, I guess it would just be more my taste. I also think a lot about, um, because I work so much with projection, which operates differently as sc than screens, you know? If you're showing like a film on a monitor, for example, versus a film in projection, there's different things that you have to consider visually. So with video projection, I'm always thinking about contrast. I'm always thinking about the contrast ratio and how I can boost it. So in a, in a room like this where there's ambient lighting, I want to make sure that the blacks look as black as possible and that um, all the information is legible. So I tend to use highly saturated colors as a result, and I tend to use colors that have a lot of contrast um, together. Um, it's just kind of like dorky stuff that I think about. I get upset, like, if the blacks aren't the same, like, I knew on here they wouldn't be the same. Um, but that's kind of, that's what my eye is always looking for when I'm dealing with projection. Yeah. Yes? Kind of a, that's a dorky question, but in the sense of, like, the programming of Firewall and yeah. everything, in terms of the, the programmers, do they have any of their own, like, artistic signature when typing their code or something like that? Because I know that um, in terms of a lot of programmers, at least when I did a lot of research on the matter, like, they want to be able to make the code their own, yeah. and seeing how this is a really artistic project, and I'm wondering if any of them have their own signature. That's a good question. Um, so Dan Pfeiffer, who was the first guy I worked with, he's done a ton of creative projects. Like, he, for example, helped build the MoMA website, the website for iBeam. Are you all familiar with iBeam? It's a really great... Um, I'll pull up their website just because y'all should know about it. It's um, a great organization based in Brooklyn that has um, a lot of artist residencies, grants, um, and anything that has to do with technology and art, they are the go-to. So I think he has a pretty unique um, perspective on code in the sense that he believes everything should be open source. So uh, our initial code was written um, uh, for a WordPress platform. And you know we have all of our code available on GitHub. We have some spotty documentation, unfortunately. Um, but because this is a collaborative project that's nonprofit, um, most of our developers are working as volunteers. So after he stepped down, he started, he started a job at the ACLU. And then I think he actually just started another job, so I don't know where he is now. Um, but we've had to bring in other collaborators. And so when they sit down and look at Dan's code, they don't necessarily tell me what his style is because I'm not sure I would really understand what that means anyways. But you can definitely see when you're switching collaborators how that person is trying to get to used to how the code was structured and written. And it takes a lot of time for that transition to happen. So, um, so I don't know if I could describe the code, but I will just say that he has a particular philosophy in the sense that everything should be super accessible. And, um, and um, then 
the guy that I'm working with now, Peter Baer, he is a former developer for Amazon. And so having worked for a really large organization like that versus Dan who has worked with many arts organizations and smaller nonprofits, there is definitely a stylistic change in the way I work with them. So, um, you know, some coders are more like artists and they work in like an intense fury and things are not so documented. And some other developers are super methodical and everything must be documented and super organized. And so I've seen that kind of ebb and flow and that stylistic difference as I've worked with different coders. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, but also um, it's interesting to listen to how coders think about sharing code within the community, especially because we use WordPress. And um, I actually got to meet one of the founders of WordPress um, at the last Oslo Freedom Forum. And so we've talked about what is um, a democratic approach towards sharing that kind of resource and making it accessible for the public. And you know, obviously for WordPress, that's a huge part of what they do. Um, so eventually, my kind of pie in the sky dream would be to make firewall accessible in such a way that if somebody really wanted to install it on their own computer, they could. Um, but the technical challenge with that is that um, the internet is always evolving and Google changes and updates their browser on a regular basis and so does Baidu. And every time they do that, it breaks our code and then we have to like update it. So the project requires an intense amount of um, maintenance. And as a result, I don't know how much longer we're going to be able to keep on doing these pop-ups. So that's why we developed all of this like web access for the archive so that the project could live on in the future even if we stop doing pop-ups. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you see in the future taking the firewall Hmm, that's a good question. Um, we've done a lot of pop-ups and usually those are installation based. So we'll build like an entire kind of cafe-like environment. Mm -hmm. I haven't, well actually yeah, that's not true. Our last, two, my last two shows in Vienna and also in Asheville were group shows. So there were other artists who were interested in similar issues on the internet or with technology and they had projections and different like sculptures and installations that it showed with. Um, I don't know actually what form it will take in the future. It just kind of, as an installation artist, I tend to respond to like a space that's given to me or a challenge where I know I'm going to work with a specific group of people. Like, you know, like for the Met project, I knew I was going to work with kids. Um, so I don't have like a specific vision, but I try to be like very open because I, my philosophy is the more people who want to see it, the better. And so I'm willing to kind of adapt the project um, as I go based on whatever I'm offered. Um, but yeah, no specific um, ideas right now, yeah. Yes? There's a really question about your work. People like, as a college student graduating in two months, I don't know what I want to do with my life still. So like, I'm curious, you said you went to grad school for painting, so what brought you to the projection yeah. and the videos and that? That's a really good question. And actually, one of the things I didn't mention in my talk is that I've worked as a career counselor at multiple colleges for art and design students. So I did that at Maryland Institute College of Art and also at Fashion Institute of, Institute of Technology. And like in my, I run a senior capping class um, at Marist. And so I'm like really passionate about helping students figure out this bridge and how to cross it. Um, for me, I think that going back to graduate school was this desire that I knew I didn't want to just exist in the normal corporate environment. I had done it for a couple of years. It was not a bad way of experiencing New York, but it wasn't quite enough for me. But the thing is, I knew when I left advertising to go into the art world, I was going to sacrifice a lot. Like, namely, my pay <laughs> was going to be like chopped into like a third, you know? Um, but it was, it, was a, it was worth it for me. And a lot of things had to be in place for that to be possible. I had to pay off all my debt first, you know? And if I had a lot of debt, maybe I would still be a painter today. Because in New York City, if you really want to generate income as an artist, painters do it, right? It's much more hard for video artists, um, much more hard for documentarians. Documentarians are like fine artists. They really have a hard time. Uh, they have to raise their own funds and everything is kind of nonprofit. Um, so I had paid off my debt and that helped a lot. 
I also managed to secure like really affordable rent in New York, which I am lucky that I still have now. And so that frees me up to be able to do things that, um, or, so it like keeps my costs of living low, you know, and it frees me up to do things that I just enjoy and I don't have to worry so much about income. But to answer kind of the philo philosophical aspect of your question, I never planned to stop being a painter. <laughs> like I went into grad school as a painter and I thought I would just be a painter. <laughs> but when I was in grad school, I like got really harsh critiques and <laughs> basically got the painter like kicked out of me. Um, I was part of a multi interdisciplinary program. That was intentional because I could have been part of the painting program. I was waitlisted for the painting program and I decided not to wait for that and just be part of the interdisciplinary program because I did know that I had a curiosity about engaging with technology and other ways of expression. Um, but I didn't really know what that would be yet. Luckily, I made that choice because after getting these harsh critiques, I stopped painting altogether. I just couldn't do it anymore. I still have like a lot of anxiety about painting and image making. <laughs> um, but what I found was that I was really, really curious about video. So I, I did make a documentary when I was in grad school about my grandmother, actually. Um, who had bound feet. And um, my graduate instructors at the time really wanted me to go to film school and um, enter the work into documentary festivals. But I also knew that, um, you know, having come from the world of communications and kind of knowing journalism some, I, I knew I liked the style of video, the way of working and the process of video, the production process, but I really wasn't interested in making documentaries. And so that's when I forced myself to like really figure out what are ways I can bring in kind of the visual exploration of painting into video? And how can I display video in a way that is maybe more similar to the process of looking at a painting than looking at a traditional film or video that's narrative? And that's how I ended up with those kind of projection paintings is what I used to call them, or those kind of um, after effects animations where I was dealing with drawing and embedding green screen. That's how I ended up there. And that work got a really good response in Baltimore, DC. There were a couple of galleries that wanted to show it. So I worked with a couple of galleries for a while there. Um, but then um, I just became more curious as a result of like going on trips and stuff. And that's how Firewall and all these other things evolved. But it wasn't planned. It was just like being curious and following the medium you know, so if you work within a medium for a while, it will lead you to very specific questions that you get to decide how you want to respond to. You can push back and go a different direction, or you follow those questions even deeper into your inquiry. You know, so for me, there was some pushing back, which is why you see me, my work kind of bounces around a little bit, and that's normal, and I give myself that freedom um, to kind of explore, yeah. Um, there's some work I haven't shown because I thought it was a little bit less relevant to what we're doing, what you're doing in this class. You know, I've been doing some corporate commissions. <laughs> so it's not the same as selling a painting, you know, but it is in a sense a little bit like doing consulting or freelance work where a client says, I like this kind of work and I want you to make something here, right? So I just did, um, I can, I'll just show you very briefly. I won't talk about it in depth, but um, I just did a piece um, where I did a 3D animation on glass. This is the piece here. It's called Aqua Lumen. And um, it's totally different than the other kinds of work I showed you. But here um, you see it's a seven foot handmade glass disc that I had fabricated and manufactured in New Mexico at a glass factory. And then um, the client originally <laughs> wanted a water fountain for their lobby, and then they figured out how expensive a water fountain was, and then they were like, oh, there's this video artist that does stuff with water on the ground, like maybe she can do something for us. So they wanted me to just create a projection for the wall in this like luxury high-rise apartment building. And I said, well, I live in an apartment building, and even though I love video art, I wouldn't want to come home every day to a blank wall with a projection on it. It feels a little bit sterile or maybe not quite enough. Most expensive lobbies have a work of art that's like something, an object on the wall. So I proposed to them like, why don't we try a crazy experiment where we create the illusion of water through glass, 
but then that glass can also be um, a, basically a canvas or a support for the projection and then the projection itself also has some qualities where like it the light refracts off of the glass onto the wall right and so um, you know that would be an example of following the medium where it takes you right so it's not like I ever planned to work with glass or do lobby commissions <laughs> but it just kind of happened talked a little bit about the difference between the grad school critique and the undergrad critique in oh, terms yeah. of well, very very lightly that you know the, the grad school critiques are, are pretty harsh and they're pretty robust in terms of uh, competition mm -hmm. um, the story I like to tell is when I went to grad school the painters uh, were very proud of the fact that they did not paint that they were artists not painters uh -huh. And then if you did any sort of painting, they would like crush you for it. No, you, you're not a painter. You can't do mark making or painting yeah. or anything like that. So there is a little bit of that contradiction at play. Um, but I, I think the important thing uh, to speak to, and especially we have a few students here who are interested in potentially going to grad school, awesome. is that you, know, you, you don't get pigeonholed into that one medium like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm a painter or I'm a video artist or I'm a this or a documentary filmmaker, right? Like, that you open yourself up to all possible avenues and that you allow your ideas to come forth and then you decide what's going to be most appropriate for that, um, you know, for that idea. And so it, in terms of, of your work, you, you see that coming through that you, know, you were able to evolve. So could you speak a little bit to that in terms of that process of evolution? Yeah. So, um, I mean, before I started doing video, I was a painter's painter. I really loved painting. And so it was very much about exploring the medium and understanding like the physical properties of paint, how far you can push it, how far you know it starts to fall apart. Um, but the, the one thing that the, being part of the interdisciplinary program um, at, at the school I went to, so I went to the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore, MICA, and the program that I did is called Mount Royal. And the thing that I learned about inter interdisciplinary thinking is that the concept of your artwork is what comes first. And that concept can be executed or communicated through a variety of medium, but the, cho the choice that you have as an artist is what medium best serves that idea. And so part of the reason I think why my work isn't so discipline specific is because I continue to work that way. So whatever the idea is, the method that you choose to bring that, um, that idea to life must be the form that best suits that idea, right? So f form follows function. And so whatever it is that you're communicating, it might be best communicated, you know, as kind of like a decorative craft glass that is kind of ornamental and in a particular context, or it might be something that's more activist, something that is performance-based, is a little bit challenging, requires audience participation to kind of disseminate the message, which is the purpose of activism, right? And so that's kind of the, my, my guiding principle, I guess, in terms of working with different media. Um, but the challenge of that is that um, you have to be willing to learn a lot of stuff you don't know. Like, I don't know how to code, but I have to be able to communicate with web developers in a way that is productive. And so it's, it's required being adaptable and learning like certain language sets that I don't necessarily know. Like if you try to talk to coders and you're not familiar with what they're talking about, it's like a foreign language, right? So I've had to learn a lot about that. And similarly with some of these other projects where I'm working with new materials. Um, when I was working with weather balloons, I had to do tons of research and find, you know, the most weather reputable weather balloon company, which is like Kmont based out of Kansas. It's like some very random. And like understand, you know, how much pressure load can a balloon take versus not take? Um, and what's the uh, downfalls to buying cheap balloons off Amazon, you know? So um, you have to be um, resourceful and you have to be kind of open and, and kind of think of your creative inquiry, not just to what you're making, but also understanding the field that you're starting to intersect with and integrate with. Um, and that requires 
talking to a lot of people who are working in that field that you may not be familiar with. Like, I mean, if you're doing documentaries, for example, and you're choosing a subject, a lot of what you're doing actually as a documentarian is like understanding what that world is about, asking the right questions, meeting people, and understanding what are their concerns. And then as an artist, then you have to decide like, well, what part of that fits into what I'm actually trying to accomplish as an artist? Not all of their concerns have to be like something you take on. You still have material um, uh, kind of concerns and concerns about communicating clearly to your audience. And so you kind of have to filter all of that into something that's digestible so that the end result that you make has connection points with your audience, right? Especially as video and filmmakers, you have to be aware of your audience. And so if you're not, then you might end up creating something that doesn't speak to them, you know? Uh, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> but yeah, and in graduate school, I will say, if you're thinking about going to graduate school, especially for film, film media, video or media production, you know, you want to ask yourself, do I want to be at an arts institution at a film school, for example, which will have a particular approach to the history of filmmaking and videography and kind of a unique set of concerns versus like, am I going to go to a university or college that has other kinds of academic offerings? So you're just a smaller fish that's part of a larger pond, but that also approaches the way that you will be learning from them. So, um, you know, that was something, because I had gone to a university before and then went to an art school, I like didn't even realize the kind of choice I was making. And now looking back, I wish I had somebody to kind of guide me through that. It all worked out fine, it was fine. Um, but it's helpful as you're shopping for graduate programs to kind of understand the differences of that. Public versus private, you know, what kind of funding is available for your graduate studies. Thanks for your questions and for listening.